Hi, this is Kaisa Carlson, Deputy Editor of Dezine, and I'm broadcasting live from the Dezine studio in London. Today, we're teaming up with Philips TV and Sound to launch a series of talks exploring the cutting edge of product design and inviting guests from different disciplines to speak on the challenges designers face. This first talk will explore the notion of European design. What does that mean for different areas of design? Can it even be said to exist? And what does the future hold for it? I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by Rod White, who is Chief Design Officer at Philips TV and Sound, architect Mary Arnold Forster, founder of Mary Arnold Forster Architects, and Jaime Moreno, founder and CEO of design consultancy Mormedi. And instead of me introducing you to our viewers, I was hoping that you could start by uh, telling them who you are and just say a little bit about what you do. And if we could start with Rod. Hi, Rod. Hi there. Um, I'm uh, based in Amsterdam. I've been here for the last 10 years or so. I'm responsible for the, the design of um, Philips TV and sound and monitor uh, products under the Philips brand. Um, and we have a design team here based in Amsterdam and two further studios in Asia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rod. And then moving on to Mary, who's joining us from Scotland. If you could say a little bit about yourselves. Um, I'm an architect in private practice. We have a small studio here. There are four architects and two uh, assistants. We de design and deliver uh, buildings in remote and difficult places in Scotland, mostly private houses and some community buildings, a few commercial product. But we are uh, we're keen to get things built. <laughs> yeah, so we're just a traditional architecture practice. That's wonderful. Thank you, Mary. And then finally, Jaime, if you could tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, I'm Jaime Moreno, and uh, my background is industrial design. I graduated from Arkansas College, and I founded uh, Mormedi 23 years ago. And what we do is design strategy and product innovation. We're based in Madrid, uh, but uh, we work across the globe. 70% of our business is coming from outside Spain, mainly Europe, US, and Asia. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jaime. And all the people participating with us today have prepared a little presentation just to go into further detail about their work. So um, I think starting again with uh, Rod, if you could just show us what you do. Okay, then let me know when you see this, please. Yes, that's great. Okay. So basically, this this basically captures what we do. We, as a team, we design um, both business to business products for monitors and IT accessories. But a large part of what we do is business to consumer, whether that's television or uh, headphones, audio, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So as a team, um, so this was a picture taken pre-COVID when we were in the studio. Uh, day on day. Uh, this captures some of the team from the Amsterdam setup. Um, as a team, we cover a lot of products across, across a lot of different categories. Uh, and the process that we have is basically an, an, an annual calendar. So to, to generate that, we uh, have an annual uh, identity program, which you see in progress there. So a lot of hand sketching, defining details, whether it's uh, junction of parts coming together for a television or a stand, remote control sound bar, uh, whatever it may be. So that's the seed of what we uh, have as a process. And from that, together with the business groups, we define the ranges and obviously take it further into CAD and models uh, going forward. So the televisions take up a large part of uh, our day, I would say. Uh, Philips televisions are known for Ambilight, a uh, key differentiator in, in the category itself. We also recognized five, six years ago that sound was no longer uh, acceptable. So we, we uh, now partner with uh, Burrs and Wilkins, the audio brand from uh, the UK, best possible partner for the best possible sound together with Quadrat, uh, who's a fabric manufacturer from Denmark. So again, we are reaching out to different European partners to together create the best possible um, proposition. 
So in this, you see identity detailing coming in from Bowers, uh, Twitter detailing the fabric, allowing the acoustic transparency that we need to perform as a product. But overall, it's a product that needs to fit uh, seamlessly into the home. So that's our, our target more or less for the home categories. Within audio for our Philips brand, the last few years we've been taking care of audio as well. So Fidelio is our top of the top for, for audio products, whether they be at home. Fidelio very much stands for um, a unique identity, meaningfully different uh, archetypes, such as, as you see here, detachable uh, rear sound units, battery driven to give an easy experience for watching movies at home. Uh, a simple form, which is not gonna be overpowering in the home sitting below the television and the coming together of materials in a pleasing uh, manner. Similarly for our Fidelio headphones. So when we uh, relaunched the Fidelio headphone range last year with what you see here, we wanted to create an identity that basically is recognizable through the, the skeletal aluminum frame Aluminium in itself is, of course, recyclable, which is driving a lot of the decision making that we have. Again, uh, the fabric on the open back indoor headphone solution that you see there uh, is underpinning that interior fit. Um, and our other material partner beyond Quadrat is Muirhead, who are a Glasgow uh, company making premium leather, uh, which you see there in the overhead part. So this was our um, indoor headphone. And then this year we just launched the outdoor solution. So as such, we've been exploring European design over the last, I would say six, seven years of how we as a Philips brand are meaningfully different to the competition. And we have four principles that we as a design team adhere to. And this I think encapsulates it. So basically we wanted to have clear direction as a product, whether it's a remote control or a pair of headphones. Uh, there's no unnecessary decoration, uh, innovative use of materials. And the fourth uh, defining um, principle is that the, the finessing of the details as the materials come together. So that's the story of what we basically are as a team. But I also want to quickly put in some slides. So as a starting point for every annual calendar, we create a trend book. And this was the distilled four trends that we saw end of last year, moving forward, looking forward as a recognition of what the COVID years have done for us. And I just wanted to feed this into the discussion for today. So the first of which obviously is hopefully self-explanatory. It's very much, we find ourselves at home needing a lot of tech integrated in a way that's not overpowering. Uh, and we still need comfortable, minimal, pure, enjoyable spaces. So we see that starting to inform a lot of the decisions at home. Similarly, uh, Utopia. So this was basically encapsulating what we see as a reaction to the, to the uh, lockdown itself. So basically we see uh, there's a cottage, almost a cottage core trend, pushing people away from the condensed city experience, actually people leaving cities to enjoy living outdoors because now technology can allow it. Uh, and the, the focus on sustainability has, has very much increased over the last year and a half, I would say. The third is a counterpoint to that, uh, which we capture with what you see here as a glitch, is basically there is a counterculture uh, led by the digi digitally um, disconnected. So there's an in interest or investigation into that kind of potentially ugly but interesting space between the connected and unconnected and the pure, uh, beautiful spaces and things between, especially in the digital environment. And the last trend uh, is basically, again, a bit more reactionary. We see basically that there is now a stronger voice in society starting to stand up against wrongs, whether they be based on race or sex or inequality. There's a much more fluid shift across uh, geographical locations. And people are basically having a stronger voice now than ever in the last decades. Uh, and we see that as a good thing, but it starts to fuel the debate of what products are, what they should be going forward. So that's my introduction for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rod. Uh, just really, really interesting, uh, especially seeing uh, this sort of trend forecast and based on last year. I think just a quick question for you before we move over to Mary's presentation. 
Um, obviously, based on the context of this talk today, but it was just really interesting to see how many different European brands Philips is working with. Um, what does that bring to the company? Does that enhance the design of the product products that you just work with uh, companies from all over Europe? Uh, I think uh, certainly if you think about television, it's, a, it's an easy starting point. In the end, a lot of the panels are edgeless. The, the picture itself, we're driving the picture performance, so we can uh, dictate that. And the, the small details, whether it be the remote control in the hand, is something obviously we design. But when it comes to elements such as materials um, or um, the performance of the sound itself, we, want, we wanted to reach out to do the best possible uh, solution, whether it be sound through Bowers or the remote control in the hand. We wanted a proof point that we as a European design company give you something that we believe in as, as a Philips brand. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Rod. And uh, moving over to Mary, if you could please share your presentation with us and uh, tell us what you do. Can you tell me what you're seeing now? Yes, we can see your screen. I think uh, perhaps if we can, if you can maximize the screen, if that's possible. Yeah. 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 Okay. Ah, yes, there we are. Okay, sorry about that. That's wonderful. So um, a little bit about our process then. Anyone who's worked with architects, there's nothing really unusual about the way we work. We start with an analysis of site in a kind of forensic way in terms not only physically of aspect and weather and climate and geology but also and topography spend a lot of time on topography but also in terms of the cultural context uh, and that's our first step. we also analyze a brief like any designer and we are here to help our clients develop that brief uh, and so they don't need to come with it fully formed. So that's really interesting part of it. We look at a brief, we look at the site, and then we also, of course, look at a budget because we're, we're keen to deliver on budget and things. That's all changing. Then we go into a series of um, endless sketching with pencils. We go into CAD very quickly, 2D, 3D, but we also make physical models. Can I show you one physical model? Uh, This is just what, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So this is just one room actually of a house in the middle of nowhere, an off-grid development. So we have a whole series of images. So we work on the sketch scheme, then we go through the local, the authorities like planning and building warrant, and then we find a builder and we specify, we're specifying from all throughout Europe, all our materials, like we're very engaged in what's available. We're not, it, and we can't just use products locally. Whether that's a good, bad thing is a different conversation, but we are certainly uh, using specifying products from all sorts of countries, but particularly from other countries with similar climates, I have to say. Uh, we look at products that have been tested in Nordic and Alpine countries particularly, although I'm using Spanish uh, products as well. And Portuguese. So we've definitely engaged with, our work is very specific to, this place to this part of Scotland to this and the, spe the specifics to that site but they're also engaged in a kind of conversation with Europe in that sense so this is a simple building that sits in a very we talk in our office about making the ordinary extraordinary so these are very simple buildings and when you drive past you can think oh, there's no architects being involved there but actually if you can't look closer you'll see that we have been there. I'm quite happy if someone drives past one of my buildings and says, and doesn't notice that the architect's been there. So we have a lightness of touch. They're quiet, but they're pretty rigorous. This is just a uh, aluminium black shed, really, and it's lined in Danish Douglas fir, and it's got a resin floor. It's a simple material. And we the storm shutters that you see there, are bedded in the wall. We 
with less going away from the wall of glass that you see with architects. And this black shed sits very quietly and the two sheds make a space. And this, how it sits in the landscape and the macro and the micro is, takes a lot of, it looks like nothing's been thought through there, but it actually takes time to make it look as if it's really settled. So that's it. There's another storm shutter there. So that, that image is dusk, really, and this material inside glows. It's very powerful. This building it isn't actually flooded with light. There's a window on the east, the window on the south, the window on the west, and the window on the north. So you're aware of the passage of the sun. And in these northern latitudes, that is, you have to enjoy the big weather and you have to enjoy the very long summers and the sh very short winters, short days, I have to say. And this is about being outside, but also hunkering down to the inside. And it is, we work with amazing craftsmen who, this was a totally collaborative project. My client's an architect actually, yes, so that's interesting. Uh, and the guys who made it, uh, you'll see some of their work inside. So this is a single material building uh, and it's a very simple agricultural form, but this particular space uh, is taken right into the, volume of the roof and that's there's only one material that others can stay in this we use double I know the guys who made it and it was really special. Whether we even choose the light fittings I think where are the light fittings from? I think they're German. Anyway there's all sorts of European products there. We rely on that. The best windows come from Norway, Germany, the Baltic uh, countries um, there's only one person in Scotland making windows of that quality. Yeah, the table was made like this. This is another kind of building set in a really rugged piece of landscape. So, in this particular occasion, I, I was it's a very ordinary piece of land. There's lots of land, land like this in Scotland. It's there's very little soil, it's heather, and it's very, I don't know about, I'm sure you find it elsewhere, but I'm very used to seeing this heather and grasses and the rock very close to the surface. So again, it's making it an extraordinary, this uh, landscape. I saw it, I didn't feel it was my place to do any rock breaking, which is a, an aggressive thing. I didn't want to pour any more concrete on Scotland and I wanted to do a modular off-site construction. So this was built entirely in a factory in 13 units and brought down a single track road. It was quite a performance. Uh, and it's fully demountable. And so there are three units and a glazed, um, that, can you get that model? Do you mind? Yeah. Yeah, and then a glazed link between the three. So this came and it was uh, delivered and erected in four days. So modular construction demountability is interesting in these times. There's another conversation about sustainability. On top of that, it's in the grey box. Gray box. Yeah. So, uh, um, the CLT in this case is Austrian. So we're trying to make CLT cross laminated timber in Scotland. The grey box, top right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Just to go through it. Yeah. So the, the, in this case, I was trying to avoid. Well, there's one other thing about the cladding. This is my. I want the, the silver birch is the local one of the local trees, and I wanted to an abstracted version of the cell phone. Can you see that, Emma? That's yeah. how it sits in the landscape. So we make a lot of models and then we build them. So great, one-to-one -one model. So that was my abstracted version of the silver birch in winter, the cladding. Whether that's successful or not is another question, but um, it moved it slightly wobbly. Uh, yeah, it glows from the inside. It's got no heating. The system It's a super efficient building. And, and we learned from other countries that this is a very um, well-used technology in Norway, particularly, and Austria and Switzerland. Cross-laminated timber is, is uh, a way of using low-grade timber that, in my view, uh, we should be using more in Scotland and things. So I'm trying to help that industry make a lovely building for my clients, not make a mess of these beautiful landscapes and also help ex help show that this product is um, useful and lovely and worth making in Scotland. 
Uh, yeah, so we have no wet finishes, we're making it all out CLT. There, there is some heating, and then of course, just framing the view once rather than an endlessly. There's no steel, there's no poured concrete, there's no heating system. Uh, and then there are things specific to Scotland. There's some, there's a midge screen. I don't know if you've heard of the midge, anyone? So a certain kind yeah. of bug. <laughs> so specific to sites, specific to my clients. Um, and yeah, using materials that, uh, uh, you know, that is really robust and long lasting. So that's just two of our projects. We have, uh, we have 24 different projects, all different, and yet all the same, well, mostly domestic. And this forensic process goes on for every project. Each project is, is developed independently of the other ones. We're detailing at the moment. Is that, does that help understand a little bit about our work? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. It's yeah, really, really interesting. And I mean, such thank beautiful you. buildings. It's just, yeah, great thank to you. see them like this. I wish. Wish I could see them in person because the that large clad one is just incredible. Yeah, it's beauty. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Shall I stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah, you're back with us. Uh, um, I think the question. I was I was curious when you were talking about uh, this idea of creating homes that sit within the landscape. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that? Do you start with thinking about the materiality of the design, or is it the the form of the houses? It, well. Um, and we, we, before we design, well, before we actually start, we really need a proper, it's really rigorous analysis of what we got before you start designing on it to so really understanding the site and really understanding its place and really understanding the brief before you design seems to, uh, we try and do that. Obviously, I'm an, I sketch all the time and I can't stop myself sketching in front of clients and drawing and thinking because I'm a designer through and through, but it, this analysis site, we take it really quite seriously. And the, the, the poor surveyors, or if we do it, the surveys we do of what's existing are, are, really, are really precise. Uh, and yeah. to make it look like there's a lightness of touch actually takes a lot more work than not, if that makes I think that's true of all designers. If you, to make it look easy, you have to really, really work at it. It's, it's yeah. easier to be clumsy than to be delicate, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Mary. I'll, uh, I'll move on to Jaime for our last presentation. So uh, Jaime, if you could please share your screen and tell us about your work. Yeah. Thank you, Kasia. Um, so. I guess, can you see? Yes, yeah. all good. Okay. <clears throat> so as I was mentioning before, um, uh, more maybe we are a um, global boutique uh, design strategy and product innovation firm. And uh, what uh, we base uh, all our strategy in projects or products that they have a meaning. And to understand that meaning, uh, is uh, the first thing we do is understanding the, the culture and the cultural basement. So I don't think um, we're talking very often about global design. There are some type of products uh, or services that has to be designed, taking into account, uh, I mean, the, the cultural basement. No? So when uh, you were approaching me about talking about uh, European design, I thought maybe it was good to give a quick overview about uh, things that we think they are different uh, in, in terms of design uh, all over the globe. The, the globe. So uh, when we talk about Europe, uh, we're talking about more uh, about rational design. We're talking about more about sustainability. And uh, as Rod was mentioning before, especially now, but even before, I think uh, European countries, uh, they are quite um, sustainable in terms of public transportation or in terms of uh, design. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can see also individual uh, design and uh, you cannot see Europe as a whole. Uh, if I have to uh, identify trends in design or, or special features, I think you need to differentiate the northern countries, Scandinavian design, then Anglo-Saxon countries maybe, and Mediterranean. No? And the lifestyles uh, and the type of materials, colors and products that you would see 
those different regions uh, would differ quite a lot. Even within Spain, if you look at uh, uh, the north of Spain and the south of Spain, you can also uh, find some differences. If we look at the USA, uh, you're looking at a more pragmatic approach, uh, contrast, um, spontaneous choices, and uh, so you can feel the difference of these mood boards. No? And, uh, and this is basically what we're mentioning, what I was mentioning about the, the difference between the different cultural basements. No? Or if we look at some Asian countries, uh, the use of color is different, uh, the use of geometry, materials, uh, graphics. And uh, this at the end is going to affect the, the, the type of design that we will see in those countries. No? Or South America that we'll see more playful design. Uh, of course, I mean, some re regions more price sensitive, but the more practical, uh, durable materials, and, uh, but also socially conscious. No? And just to share with you a few of the projects, I mean, the, during these 23 years, we have worked across the several different industries. Um, mobility for us is quite a big industry. Uh, we have worked from aircraft interiors to train interiors, um, scooters or this electric uh, three-wheel vehicle that you see here. No? And uh, the first thing we do when the, we have um, a project like this is uh, try to find a unique value proposition. How we can help our clients to create uh, not just a unique design, but uh, how they can add value uh, by the product itself, no? in terms of performance or the specifications. So one of the things we discover when the client came uh, to us to design this vehicle, they wanted to design a two-seater vehicle, electric with three wheels uh, to use uh, around the city with no helmet. Uh, the first product that uh, was designed in this category was the BMW C1 back uh, in the end of 90s, uh, year 2000. And um, so we, we did a strong benchmark and also one of the purpose of this project that was that it was going to be used for car sharing. Um, so it had to be very easy to use, a very stable uh, sense of safety. Uh, so we tried to create a, a vehicle that was uh, looking very uh, easy to drive, um, that uh, it would be easy access, um, very stable, uh, and uh, the user would feel very protected. This is a project that we have done uh, for a Spanish stream. It's a customization of a Mercedes Vito and uh, is for more for luxury uh, shuttles. And uh, we try to create also a very um, uh, warm atmosphere, uh, very cozy, like feel at home, using materials that normally they are not used inside the cars, like a wood floor and uh, very soft shapes, very human uh, in order to feel very comfortable. And uh, last but not least, um, um, this is a project that we, we feel very proud of it because we, we really, um, we get every year, I mean, two or three inquiries uh, regarding this issue. We try to change the vending industry and upgrade it uh, instead of just selling sandwiches of one or two euros. Why don't you, you uh, in a self-service machine, you can buy a full meal. And uh, this means that you could uh, order a salad, a main dish, dessert, hot drink, um, a coffee, and it would all come together within 90 seconds. And uh, what we try when we, vending machines normally are done of stainless steel, they're very industrial. Uh, and here with the use of wood and glass, we try to uh, create a new product that basically was an extension of a cafeteria and that would fit uh, very well in any, any environment inside the building. And that's it. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. It's so great to see the work that you do and also that it spans so many different industries and genres, I guess. I, uh, I think the one thing that really struck me here, like it was so nice of you, of you to start with that kind of categorization of different uh, geographical aspects of design. And I was wondering as we're all getting kind of more and more connected and uh, the world is, you know, increasingly everyone pretty much has internet. Do you think design is becoming more homogenous on a global scale? Or do you think we'll continue to see these quite different types of designs from different types of the world? 
I think uh, we see more and more customization uh, regarding the region. I mean, there are some products that are very global and, uh, and iPhone is a sample. I mean, they have the same colors and the same products all over the world. But um, uh, there are certain products that, for example, if you just observe, you go to Seoul uh, and you see the colors of the cars. Uh, most of them are black or gray. Uh, and, and you go to France and you look at the colors of the cars and they're completely different. No? So this reflects you that uh, there's a culture behind. No? They are same, same cars, same brands, but different colors, uh, different textiles in the interiors, different preferences. So I think you need to design with a global uh, reach and a global perspective, but you really need to take into account the different cultural basements uh, to understand the culture and see maybe 80% of the product strategy is global, but uh, some details or uh, some level of customization um, is, is regional. Yeah. And what would you say European design means to you at the moment? Is there anything that's typical of European design the way it is today, rather than perhaps what we associate with, say, mid-century European design? Yeah, I think if we look at Europe, uh, we're talking about timeless aesthetic. Uh, in, in general, we're talking about uh, genuine materials, the use of genuine materials, and especially uh, new patterns and uh, new features. Um, and some individual style, no? as I was mentioning, if you probably look at Italy, or Spain or Greece, compared to what you see in France, uh, Germany, uh, or UK, uh, or compared to what you see in Norway, you, you could feel just taking some pictures about the landscape and the different objects that you could buy, you could identify very quickly that uh, it's not the same. And Rod and Mary, would you agree with that? Uh, what does is there such a thing as European design, and uh, what does it mean to you and to your work? Uh, I would well, I'll go first. But I would say there is definitely a difference between different areas of Europe, so it's it's not possible to generalize completely. Uh, but I think specifically from our Northwest European perspective, uh, both personally but also where I am based in Amsterdam as, with the Philips brand, I think there is a unwillingness to stand still so as a design movement. So there is a, a, a belief that there needs to be meaningful innovation in materials combined with um, user needs rather than a technology push. But underneath it all, there's an un unwillingness to stay. Even if you come up with a good idea, there's always a need to push that forward in a meaningful direction, which I think is underpinning what European design is for us. Mm. Mary, would you agree with that? Sorry, Murray, can you, can you hear us? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes you're back. Yeah, yeah um, well, 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 particularly my work is very specific to where I am, though I don't think, um, and, and I work to understand the landscape I'm in. I wouldn't half mind working in Europe, I have to say, but I would really need to understand it. And I've turned down work where I don't understand the landscape. Particularly. A lot of my friends work in the Far East and the Middle East. And I would, and I would hope that they understand the place they work in because it should come out of it. It's not that we're a, as an academic. I do it in any academic sense. I'm fully aware of uh, architecture, the modern architecture in other countries, and I studied in Barcelona personally, so um, I can uh, relate to it. But it, I'm really interested in people uh, it being specific to its place and things. I, I don't know if I, I'm in the position to talk about Europe, particularly because my work is so based here. And um, the only places I've worked apart from here are just in England. And the only, so it's not really, I'd feel unqualified to talk about that, to be honest. As you know, though, I use a lot of products from Europe and uh, I'm very happy with them on the whole, yeah. And one aspect that uh, Jaime mentioned that he thinks is quite, um, typical of European design, I suppose, is this approach to sustainability and the importance of working sustainably. And uh, Mary, that is obviously something that your practice thinks about a lot. Oh yeah, and then I get asked, are you an eco-architect? Imagine saying you're not, you know, every, it just should be ingrained. It shouldn't be something you apply to your work. It should be fundamental to it. Um, and it's complex. Sustainability in the building industry is 
is really abused. I mean, I, there's a lot of gadgetry that I can put in a building that somehow I sometimes feel uncomfortable about. There's a lot of uh, renewable technologies, for example, there's a lot of smart technologies and, and I'm, I, you know, whether that's a sustainable way. I, don't know. I think we lost Mary for a second there. Yep. Right, I think she's looking for something. Um, Mary, are you still here with us? I think maybe it got frozen. Uh, that would explain it. Okay, well, let's let's keep our eye on Mary. I think her internet might have frozen, so hopefully she'll be back with us soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, one subject that we wanted to discuss, ah, I think she might have to restart her screen. Uh, right, I'll just leave it up to you, Rod and uh, Jaime, while we wait for Mary to come back. I wanted to talk a little bit about how well, I guess European design, but also your work in general has changed over the last 18 months uh, with the pandemic and uh, how that's affected your work. Well, I think from a quality perspective, it, it has changed a lot. No, I mean, the, you can imagine that having the 70% of our business out of Spain, I was traveling basically every month and, and uh, I was 10 days a month uh, traveling somewhere. And, um, and uh, also we were doing a lot of physical observation when it comes to understanding a market or a culture. And we were also uh, doing a lot of physical workshops with, with, with the client. No? So we had to, 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 to move to, to the client's office. No? Um, well, COVID has forced us to, to work remotely. Uh, we have a few projects during COVID that uh, they were global research. And, um, and one was uh, in the sector of uh, senior people and healthcare. And uh, so, when, when COVID came in and we couldn't travel and it was a lockdown, um, we were really um, trying to work hard uh, very quickly to see how we can handle those projects so uh, we, they could keep running. No? And basically help us to evolve and to do the digital research, um, uh, remote research, doing, using a lot of digital tools, uh, 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 moving physical workshops to digital workshops with tools like Miro. Uh, and I have to say, right now, we're much more efficient than uh, we used to work, uh, uh, I mean, 18 months ago. So, so for us, it has been very positive, uh, mm. even in business development. Uh, in the past, very often, you were going to visit a client uh, 5,000 kilometers from here, and they were telling you, like, uh, yeah, but I have somebody around the corner. Uh, but today, it does not really matter, because uh, in some cases, you cannot meet. So it has also opened us the opportunity to, to work uh, and to start working with clients that uh, they are in other continents. Uh, uh, I have to say for us has been uh, quite, quite positive, uh, apart from yeah. uh, the, the disease, which is quite sad, no? what has happened and all the people has been affected. So for you, it's changed the way in which you work. And uh, Rod, from what you were saying earlier, it seemed like it's actually kind of changed the sort of products that people are after now. I, I Can think you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. It's, similarly, I would spend a lot of uh, every month flying, and that's gone. Um, and I think it's led to a much more efficient process for the design team, but also the business team in general. So there are far fewer unnecessary meetings of people just because that's how the calendar was uh, set up in the past. So, and I think that's also a reflection of the new technology that we have at, at, at hand, which was not there 10 years ago, obviously. Um, that in the case of the products that we create, there's been quite a spike in the need for monitors, for example, example working from home, noise cancelling headphones. Those are devices that uh, suddenly became much more popular. So this, it's not been the worst year business-wise. <laughs> Obviously, it's been a terrible uh, year for other perspectives. Uh, but I think as a design team, there's a lot more efficiency and realization that things had to change and we're a, a, quite a lean organization because of it. And as, as far as the focus on new product categories, there is much more investigation, especially coming in from Asia for um, 
not just communication, but also entertainment at home, connecting people between gaming environments. Gaming is taking off with a huge amount of uh, increase in monitors, headsets, keyboards, mice, mice mats, um, all sorts of, uh, the ecosystem of gaming has become much more uh, forefront because people are at home wanting to be enter entertained. So that's, that's keeping us busy for sure. That's really interesting. So you're seeing this trend coming in from Asia and then um, affecting what you're thinking about coming up from, from Philip's side, like what's next? Yeah, actually, maybe a couple of years ago, I remember visiting iCafes in China, which are huge emporiums of gaming, where um, mostly late teenage males are gaming through the night. Uh, but that kind of went down because of working from home or being at home. So that shift has taken gaming into the home environment. So actually both in Asia but now also in Europe you see an increase in a need for a premium gaming experience so it's it's an opportunity but it's also a reflection of what's been going on the last 18 months. Welcome back Mary. Sorry guys. <laughs> ah yes wonderful Mary is back with us that's great. But that's Let's a problem. See if her... I'm so... um... Oh sorry hi I missed uh, what you were saying there oh we're back. Yeah, that's the problem of technology sometimes that uh, even if, uh, I mean, Zoom is quite well established, sometimes if you have a network uh, problem, no? Uh, yeah, I guess that's one downside that we've all noticed a lot during the last year and a half that when the te technology gives out, you're on your own. Uh, yeah. Great to have you back, Mary. We, uh, we had a chat uh, a bit about how the pandemic has affected everyone's work over the past 18 years. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when we were speaking yesterday in preparation for the call, we also touched a bit on uh, lack of materials, things that have changed, perhaps due to the pandemic, perhaps due to other recent political upheavals. Uh, how has that been for you as an architect? Has work been the same in the past few months? Or? I know. It's a challenge. Uh, we are put, we're not starting on site with anything. We're just doing a lot of drawings and preparing to start next uh, spring. Anyway, bring building over the winter, you know, it's good to start in spring and finish at Christmas anyway, but it's a real challenge, but I'm determined to to get that. A lot of our materials are imported. There's a bottleneck, but Europe wants to import to the UK and they will continue to. And at the same time, the, the positives have been that there are people returning to smaller villages and towns and young people because they can work remotely. And I'm hoping that they'll be starting more workshop locally based sustainable industries rather than making stuff in Scotland, making windows out of trees that we have here. We, so there might be some positives. I knew a lot of people returning and the, that's a COVID thing. They've learned to work rurally and there's great quality of life in, personally for me and all sorts of people. And maybe that will encourage small scale industry on a more local sustainable way. And we don't need to import travel across these great yeah so i'm hoping it's a positive really it's uh, hard though so, it's hard. but hopefully it might be a boon for local production yeah hopefully i really hope so <laughs> and, uh, bringing craftsmanship there are, lot, there are some craftsmen and women who work on a very small scale but if we can persuade them to work and just another level up and make it, then i'm i'm hopeful that uh, the building industry is a big employer uh, wherever, to be honest, uh, and it, we can't, it can't, it's not really, I only do a bit of affordable housing, it's not really about my private clients that is the concern, it's about schools and hospitals and affordable housing, we have to have the building industry going again, and uh, I, I would like to, it simply to be, Europe, continue to be European uh, for the UK, personally, and I don't know any architects who don't, but uh and anyone in the building industry, we have a fantastic European builders working alongside the Scottish builders, and it's, there's been no stress about it until recently. So. But then yeah. we'll get, I'll get I'll get political, and that's not. Good. But yeah, <laughs> it might not be bad. It's it's affected us all a lot. I mean, I'm, my, mostly at the moment, I'm persuading my clients to build smaller, and I don't have any yeah. problem with that. Why do we need to live in big houses? What's what what what's what is it about the enormous house? Is it a display of wealth? That you, I don't. I, I live in a. I live very happily in a pretty small house, and they have a much more reduced impact on the landscape. They're much more in tune. They're 
far less geared up. Most of them that we mm. do, they're very simple. So there's, I'm, I'm, if I can say my clients live in uh, smaller spaces, mm. uh, and I am managing it, but then you, the clients are self-selecting, aren't they? They come to us because of the work we do. So they tend to have, I love the modesty of their, their desires often, and uh, it's mm. in tune with me and it's in tune with the landscapes, modesty, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting and also perhaps something that uh, Rod and Jaime might be able to sort of shed some light on. Do you think that the changes in the past year has led to a change in design? Are people looking for simpler designs, perhaps more locally sourced materials? Is it a, is it a trend that you're seeing in your work as well? I think, um, go ahead, Jaime. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I had two points. One was that we, we were discussing as a team last week that actually we recognize that if all designers, if all product designers are home watching the same uh, resources, whether it be Pinterest or uh, Design, for nice images as reference for future products, then, then there is a danger that things become a bit too uh, uh, homogenized as a reality. Uh, but that's more of a, a parallel discussion. But I think what is clearly coming out of both the trend slides that I showed earlier, but also reality of where we're going, is that sustainability is much more uh, forefront compared to pre-COVID days. So the government policies that are coming in underneath are obviously going to help, uh, but it was very difficult to get credible traction within companies and also within the media discussions about what sustainability could mean for con consumer electronics in the past. So us, as a Philips brand, we launched uh, an aluminium television 10 years ago called Econova, which was, was very much about sustainability. It had no plastic parts. It had aluminium recycled front, back, base, cork feet, brown box, brown uh, inner parts. It basically uh, led the way, but at the time, there wasn't enough interest in the media to pick it up, to push the product to be successful towards the consumers. But now we see that uh, all the elements from that, including a solar remote control, start to become much more interesting towards uh, society at large. So we, we start to make much more decisions based on sustainability or the impact of it, whether it be the packaging or the products themselves, which is obviously a hugely healthy, healthy direction to be going in. I would love a solar remote control. That would be amazing <laughs> because buying batteries is kind of a pain. Do you think that will become the industry standard? And if so, how long will it take for us to get to this need for products to be sustainable, to even be produced? I, well, I, I would say that uh, the regulations that are coming in initially on packaging are going to help companies um, all aim in the right direction. So that's, that's basically the, the stick, I suppose. But also the carrot is if you position your brand as being leading or at least amongst the leaders, then it, it can only benefit the brand. So there should be a win-win uh, realistically. But then also the decisions made on, for example, those headphones that we were looking at earlier, aluminium is recyclable. If you, if you don't have secondary finishing on it, the disassembly is much easier. All those kind of simple principles, no more plastic packaging within the box itself. The, those are basically not difficult steps to make, but there are a lot of steps to make within their internal process. So those are guiding the internal project teams and that's that's where we need to be going. I, I guess you say mm. see the same, Jaime, in your um, world. Yeah, I'm fully agree. I, I think COVID uh, has accelerated, uh, I mean, the, the sustainability concern, no? But it, it, even, I mean, I think nowadays, uh, we, we also look at trends and uh, change of consumer behavior, no? And uh, recently, we we discovered that after COVID, around uh, I mean, 40% uh, of the consumers they they, they they would not buy any product uh, from a brand that does not have a strong uh, purpose and meaning. No, and uh, and this is quite important. I mean, you you need to be honest. Uh, your brand has to be honest, and uh, honesty is not just on the message that they they launch; it's also on the message that uh, how you you treat the, the planet. No, and uh, so. We have seen some quick uh, wins in terms of packaging and the, the reduced use of plastics, but I think this is going beyond that. It's going. Be, it's like how we can make products that they, they take low, low, uh, less energy, 
how we can make products that are uh, more long lasting. So I don't throw it away after two years. And mobile phones is an example. I mean, I, I think it's sustainable to change your mobile phone every two years. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you have companies in the Netherlands like Fairphone and that has been fighting for this type of product since I would say a decade, no? Yeah. And, um, but, uh, but also in fashion, I mean, the fast fashion is dying. People, they don't want to consume a product, use it two, three times and throw it away. So uh, this is a big change of culture. And, and, and not just in the industry, I think in fashion, fashion art, I mean, companies like um, uh, Tara or, or the uh, CIA or, uh, are going to suffer a lot in the next decade. Uh, if mm -hmm. they don't really change the type of products they sell. I think, I think pro, uh, products, but also uh, business models. So yes. I, I remember, certainly, I'm sure Mary remembers, I did when I was a kid, remembering radio rentals was one of the ways in which you had a television in your home. You had a monthly subscription. So that's, that doesn't exist anymore. But then it's a way of keeping the television alive much longer. And those business models, whether it be in fashion or cars or uh, consumer electronics, start to be much more realistic for the future. Yeah, we, we call it flexi it's actually, uh, I mean, sorry, people... I'm a... Yeah, sorry. We call it flexi no? People don't want to buy products anymore. They want to rent it uh, and uh, cancel it with 30 days notice. And in offices, we work as a good example. We see it in co-working, I mean, co-living spaces. We're seeing it in cars. I mean, in 10 years' time, 80% of the cards uh, manufacturer would belong to fleets. Uh, so this is gonna change the whole industry. This actually ties in really well with, um, we have to wrap, wrap up in sort of five minutes or so, but we have an audience question uh, that I think is probably more for Rod than Jaime because uh, Mary, you have a, a smaller market reach, I believe. The, uh, the question is, how do you conduct research to understand your target market? How do you determine the size and the method of the research? And Mary, I think for you, you usually have one client. <laughs> but for, for Rod and Jaime, how do you mm -hmm. conduct the research to understand the market needs in your target markets? Certainly from, from my side, in the past, there were very long processes traveling the world with models that didn't arrive, et cetera. It kind of were quite inefficient uh, ways of testing design A versus B. Uh, but realistically, now it's, it's already been uh, made more efficiently, partly because of time, because the product creation processes are much, much faster than they were a few years ago. So we have, a, we have a, basically a calendar where we create design models. And initially, we bring in a few key uh, experts, business experts, re uh, retail experts, to start to have a, a dialogue to make decisions. Um, and through the year of creation of the products or televisions or, or headphones or whatever, there are key points where the people who understand the market and the people who represent the consumers give input. Uh, and then ultimately those decisions are what drive the, the, um, the products. But then go back to what Jaime was saying, we also have global product ranges, but then regional specifics. So there is a, a, there's clearly an overlap of China versus Europe, but there's there's dis distinct needs, whether they're proposition based or color material and finishing. And that's based on you sort of testing what pro products work in those markets at an early stage. Yeah, and having discussions with the, the local teams because they're the ones that have the discussions with the local markets and uh, they understand what sells, but then, and that also is realistically sales teams are focused on the next month's sales so we have to obviously balance what uh, we're getting from the sales team with what we see as a design team looking forward into maybe two years from now so it's a it's a balance of those things that dictate the decisions hmm. Jaime, is it the same for your clients is it based on local knowledge uh, how you do the uh, target market research it's a mix of local knowledge uh, uh, on one hand from different stakeholders like distributors, but uh, on the other hand, as, as Rod was mentioning, from the target of consumers that uh, you're trying to approach. But also you need to look at trends. Uh, you need to really look carefully at some trends that would, would, would provoke a change in uh, customer behavior. Uh, and you also need to think at the system level, uh, what new players are getting into a certain industry and what type of change would provoke in, in that industry. I mean, I think today 
we are living with a lot of uncertainty. We, you live with uh, uh, competitors are not coming from next door. They're, I mean, companies coming from the outside. And, uh, and this is also very important to look at. I mean, the, uh, how new intruders are getting into a certain industry, no? I mean, look at Tesla five years ago. Nobody was really paying too much attention to them, no? Uh, mm. Mary, is that something that you notice in uh, in architecture as well? Are there occasions when clients will say, oh, I never thought that this would be a suitable cladding for a building, but I've seen that it's become a trend or it's something that's more sustainable? You can unmute, Mary. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah no, definitely. Yeah, people come with uh, quite a sophisticated design intent often, and it's expressed in different ways. Again, we have, I have clients coming with Pinterest with drawings and, and a lot of images from Dizzy uh, that they want. Mm -hmm. but it's, and then you have to, you see that as part of the brief. But we have, we have some sort of very fundamental rules in this office. We only use uh, breathing wall technologies. We use sustainable products. We try and look at also no plastics and metals. We're avoiding PVCs. But, and that, that's a given. And I explained that quite early on. It's the clients. So we, uh, and it's something they can't often see, but they accept it. And it's not necessarily more expensive, but I'd like to, I'd like to help in a tiny way the building industry use less plastic. One of them, mm. uh, but the uh, people are very in design terms, and it's the internet has been great. The TV also, they've got some really sophisticated. Uh, this office works with a lot of other designers. We've got I've got a fashion designer, ceramicist, the textile designer, and it's a joy. Uh, and the one thing about sustainability, though, I mean, I did a house. The phase one was fully geared up. It had a turbine, inverter, banks of batteries, battery technologies change, it had uh, wood, but there's all sorts of big gadgetry in the heat recovery systems powered by PVs and things. But actually phase two is um, it's just really a bucket and a packet of candles and a building that's heavily insulated. So you can turn sustainability into just using less and living a more mm. simple life. And to say, to say that in front of two people who produce uh, very sophisticated products, it's, it's hard. I think there will be less people buying your stuff, Rob, maybe. The stuff will clean. Well, so. Yeah, just do less. And I, I totally agree it should last longer. This idea that cheap is good is, is just really redundant now. Make things that last, you know, make them well. I've never understood cheap is good. Who said that? I mean, I've... I feel like that's that's a note that all three of you agree on. Just make yeah. things that last, and also that consumers now know a lot more what they want than perhaps they did a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Buy less stuff. Sorry, Rod. Buy less. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually think we've run out of time now, so we are going to have to wrap up there. But I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, it was a really interesting discussion, and I hope to have you back soon and just see what's changed in the industry. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Bye.